I want one more rip. The human said in a professional tone, looming over Nalili with her usual grim face. Nalili was struggling, his avian scaled arms quaking with the weight of the Olympic bar he was trying to heft up onto its resting hooks. I am trying of lifting. Get that bar up. If you can't manage this and you can't manage our gravity, the human said, tapping his pin on the clipboard he held. Nalili was an optican. An avian species of spacefaring peoples that made their homes on multiple planets of the subfar sector. Their minds were sharp, as were their technological advances, becoming so advanced that many Optican had never even seen grass. This was in part due to how they converted their plants basically into hab units, having no need of farming or agriculture due to their output of parts, machines, ships, and other such doodads. These were traded for high credit values, allowing them to just buy their food with ease. It didn't help that their planets were small and not very dense, leading to both light gravity and very little space for agrarian activities. Their lack of resources propelled them into space at an extremely fast rate as they developed, and they managed to start harvesting nearby asteroids just in time to avoid their own society collapsing and dying. It had been a tight race, but they managed to just pull it off. Now they were an industrial powerhouse and made the finest engines in their side of space and were masters at harvesting asteroids for their dense materials. This harvesting technology is what led them being invited to Earth, as the humans themselves were struggling with material harvesting and having proper ships. With the demise of the insectoid Deramir by human hands, a lot of planets owed the humans a favor, and had found it rather annoying to have the little iron monkeys running around on their ships during the war. It was more due to humans not being able to manufacture their own ships than anything else, and they were already propped up by the Optican harvesting the resources for them during the late stages of the conflict. It was the humans that kept the Deramir from destroying and consuming the Optican in the first place, and the avian species owed a great debt to the humans. Though, the Optican thought the humans rather physically boring as far as a species went and couldn't help but feel superior to them. The Optican had avian scales on their arms and legs, short talons on their avian feet, a short feathered tail, and double thumbs on their clawed hands. Their eyes were wide and sharp, coming in all a manner of colors while their hair was more like fine feathers that went all the way down their necks. They had skins sort of like the humans, but around the outside of their thighs and calves were more fine feathers, and their faces were elongated around the nose, remnants of their ancestors having beaks that eventually smoothed out into hard-plated noses with soft lips underneath. One thing the humans had in spades was muscle and strength, owing to their planet. While the Optican were a fine-boned, fine-muscled people that would rather pay mercenaries to fight for them instead. The Optican believed the humans were just pumping their soldiers full of chemicals to make them so strong, and held the firm belief that they were just dumb brutes who were a simple anvil for the Deramir to crash against. Opticans had no idea just how weak they were until they were invited to Earth, and a ship had crashed on its journey down to the surface. The pilots had been overwhelmed by the gravity of the planet, causing them to not only struggle to control the craft, but most of them actually blacked out despite their dampeners. The Opticans had never even considered that they may have been too weak for the gravity of the planet as other spacefaring people had already landed and were running around the lush planet. Investigations over the craft even confirmed the arrogance of the pilots, who had switched off the warnings that skittered across their flight panels. It was disastrous, but thankfully the ships hauling around the actual engineers and dignitaries were able to punch back out into space and time, avoiding a far more serious tragedy. This led to a conundrum as the Optican ships lingered in space, but they had come up with a plan quickly. 
Using their far more advanced ships and technology, they sprinted back to their main homeworld of Subfar True and quickly set up a portable space station, then dragged it back to Earth within record time. The Optican glowed and rustled their feathers in the shock from the humans, as they did nothing but praise the Optican for both their ingenuity and quick thinking, and this did nothing but increase the positive reception from the humans. After all, if this species could slam together an entire space station and then drop it in orbit within only a few months, what else could they do? The biggest problem was, of course, how weak the Optican were. They had been slowly made brittle over time in both space and on their weak gravity planets, never even considering using their artificial gravity machines to strengthen themselves over who knew how many hundreds of years. Humans found their feeble bodies rather distasteful, and wondered if the avian species could even keep up with them. The other species, like the Yorpal and Poit, were struggling as it was, but they at least had some muscle on them and could handle Earth's gravity by default. While the station orbited around Earth, using complex atmospheric engines to anchor it in place, the humans set about toughening the Optican up. The humans introduced the avian aliens to something they had never seen before, and the Optican at first thought the humans were torturing them. The humble gymnasium was set up by humans shuffling equipment into the station via the ships provided by the Optican, and personal trainers set to getting these bird people into shape. At first, the obvious problem was the lack of leg muscles and core chain, so that is where they started for the first few weeks, but switched to arms. The Optican were not prepared for the insane amount of arm exercises the humans knew throwing everything from kettlebells to barbells at them and working them through a rotation of exercises. The second problem was that humans could not adjust to such low gravity, one trainer accidentally launching a kettlebell into the roof decking of the gymnasium. It was still there, too. The station had to be split into two sections with two different gravity settings. One for the humans to relax in, and one for the Optican so they could toughen up and survive. Eventually, the humans had to start wearing slightly magnetized shoes, just enough to catch the metal under the wood decking so that they could stop losing their footing in the low gravity. Nalili was a gold plume engineer, a high rank amongst his kind, and he was suffering under the weight of the arm exercises. His mottled green feathers quaked while he worked through hammer curls, alternating cross curls, preacher curls, chest flies, reverse curls, front raises. Just how many arm muscles did these humans have? Today was something called a bench press, and while Nalili had mastered the English language in only a few days, he thought it should have been called the guillotine instead. This had made another French human instructor laugh. Come on, up you come, his human said, tapping his pin on the bar so it made light ringing noises. It's only 60 pounds. Up, up, up. Nalili struggled so hard he was cartwheeling his legs, pushing with all his might. When he finally locked out his elbows, he gasped out. Five! There you go, the human said, slightly pulling back on the bar with a single hand and helping Nalili rack it. How are we feeling, Optican? Nalili's chest was heaving, sweat pouring down his skin and feathers. I am a feeling like death. <laughs> Good, the human said with a chuckle, then held out his hand to help Nalili up. You're doing better than the leg exercises. Nalili puffed out a laugh as he took the human's single-thumbed hand, and the human hoisted him up with ease. His name was Stephen. A hard name to say since Nalili kept saying Stephen, but he was kind at least. The other humans seemed far more strict and intense, so he must have lucked out. All right, we have to do another set of lumberjack squats. These are gonna work your legs and your arms, Stephen said, pointing to the landmine bar in the corner of the large gym where nearly a hundred optican were working out. The other 200 either sleeping, eating, or laying face down on massage tables and crying. Nalili put on a brave face, then wiped a towel along his cheeks. Okay, 
We are of doing the lumberjack. Stephen chuckled, walking towards the landmine bar while muttering, We are of doing the lumberjack indeed. Perhaps mastered had been a strong word, he thought. He knew what all the words meant, but speaking in the same pattern was an issue that both he and the other opticans were struggling with as well. Apparently, the humans found it cute and weren't even trying to get the opticans to change it, even demanding they keep their speech pattern. Nalili's feet clicked along the wooden floor, a favored material of the opticans since they lacked actual trees nowadays on their planets and he took up his position on the bar. He had to support the end of the bar on his chest with his palms under it, which was already making the feathers on his arms shake, then squat down, holding this pose for a few heartbeats before standing back up. His leg muscles screamed with the effort, and managed to do 20 reps before Stephen lunged forward, taking the bar in one hand and catching a lily in the other. Whoa there, Skipper, you can't go that hard yet. Stephen said as Nalili heaved in a breath, sparks popping in front of his eyes. When his workout was done for the day, Nalili went to his favorite area of the station, a large glass window that let him look down at Earth. Looking at all of that green, Nalili murmured to himself, and he couldn't help but smile. He had never actually felt grass before and something deep inside of him ached for it. He wanted to go running through the prairies and meadows he had seen in books and video recordings, swim through water that was clean and fresh, and lounge below a shade tree in the warm sun. Nalili sighed out to himself and sat down in a chair, resting his chin on his clawed fingers. Imagine of being able to waking up and just go walking in the grass. It's nice. A voice said behind him, and Nalili turned. Joseph, another one of the humans on board but not a trainer, walked around and took a seat beside Nalili on the row, leaning back and crossing his legs. There's the mountain meadows of Colorado, the desert shrub of New Mexico, the deep woods of the Appalachians, all kinds of places down there. Of course, you could also go to Europe, stroll along the high-altitude grasslands of Switzerland, the tundras of Russia, or just splash in the ocean for a bit, Joseph said, pointing down to the planet in the general area of where these locations were. We are of only having steel and concrete, Nalili said in wonder, leaning forward in earnest as he looked down at South America. What is of being in that landmass? Joseph tilted his head down at where he thought Nalili was pointing. Ah, that there's all jungle. Jungle, Nalili murmured, rolling the word around in his mouth. What is of jungle? Joseph pulled out his phone and started scrolling through pictures of the Amazon. We almost lost this place, you know that? You guys came in clutch and started feeding us resources during the war, and we were able to completely pull away from harvesting our planet. Hell, we were even able to bring back some of the extinct species with the help of your pulled gene regeneration technology. You were almost of losing all of your jungle? Nalili said in alarm, his feathers flaring in panic. Is jungle of okay? Joseph laughed, patting Nalili's shoulders. Don't you worry. The jungle is doing better than ever. Frankly, we owe you guys a lot. We were about to start cracking open our planet before you guys stepped in. Nalili felt pride in what his people had done, in helping preserve this little slice of heaven that birthed some of the strongest soldiers he had ever seen in battle. Where should I have going first? My personal answer? Joseph said, leaning forward with Nalili and pointing down to the planet. You should go to Crested Butte during the wildflower season. It has always been my favorite memory. Wildflowers? Nalili said in excitement, jumping to his feet with his enthusiasm, managing to tamp down the quick burst of soreness in his limbs. Are there of shade trees too? Joseph smiled. Yes, there are shade trees, plus a nice view of the mountains. Nalili stood in front of the window for a long time his eyes darting back and forth across this planet of paradise. After ten minutes, he looked at Joseph. How close am I of being ready? Uh, 
if you bust your ass and pass the gravity test and remember to take your calcium pills... Mm, two weeks? Joseph replied, checking his data slate. Now Lily grimaced. He hated those damn calcium pills. They tasted like dead animals and chalk, but they were designed to enhance and strengthen the anemic bone mass of the optican. He nodded his head, though, then fist-pumped the air as he turned around to Joseph. Of two weeks, then, I will be of completing it. That's the spirit, Joseph said with a wide grin. I'll let Stephen know. Only the thoughts of walking through grass kept Nalili going. Pushing through the leg press exercises, the squats, leg curls, leg extensions, the rowing, and those disgusting calcium pills. It was frustrating in some ways. Nalili could think circles around these humans all day long, but was just a moat of strength compared to their raw might. A lot of the Opticans challenged the humans to do the same workouts as them, and were quickly humbled by the trainers putting on a show of raw strength. The female Opticans were really intrigued when the male and female humans took off their shirts to show the avian species how the muscles worked, and a few of the male Opticans had to avert their gaze out of embarrassment. Nalili kept himself focused on his own goals, and after his two weeks of hard work, he was ready to take on the gravity room. There was artificial gravity on the station, set to Optican standards on their side in order to help them get used to working out at a far easier level. And it was a paltry level of technology that the Opticans could have done in their sleep. But the gravity room, the gravity room is where things took a turn. This room could be cranked up to the actual gravity of Earth and a cocky optican had broken both of his legs trying to attempt the room after just a week of working out. The room had obstacles within it, which were embarrassingly simple. Step over a small wall, crawl under a few poles, walk, jog, and run to certain points marked by color-coded markers. Lift simple objects and place them on a shelf, operate ship controls, and, worst of all, survive three g's of force in a device that spun around on a set of wheels the spinning device honestly terrified nalili they had survived for years using directional force dampeners on their ships making quick turns in space easy and reducing the risk of injury humans their fighter jets and their pilots could survive up to 10 g's this had been pivotal in decimating the Deramir during the in-atmosphere dogfights, and everyone else just simply assumed the human pilots had G-dampening equipment. Nalili remembered the collective intake of breath when both the Opticans and everyone else learned the humans were tanking raw Gs in just a flight suit, and it had caused a great stirring among the other people of the stars. Nalili remembered when a point had tried to ride passenger in one of the jets and had nearly died during a 7G turn while a pilot had just laughed, laughed, at 7Gs. Now he was going to have to walk at a single G, something the other races did with ease. He had to be strong and make the Optican proud. Nalili stood in a line with the other Optican as they were led in ten at a time and it didn't take long for his fellow Optican to start coming out of the gravity room on stretchers. Thankfully, no one was breaking their bones this time, but they were simply crashing down to the deck in exhaustion. After 110 failures, Nalili was the first of his stick to go in. Of course, the humans would call a lot of people a damn stick. It was so like them. He remembered when a human had thrown another human a spoon and everyone had to duck and cover during breakfast. Brute strength and brute simplicity of mind. Nalili noticed the gravity room had changed from before, and the control stick test was first up on the line. Nalili stood at the front of the line as they entered the room. Then a warning buzzer chimed a few times, alerting the opticans that the gravity was going to change. Stay strong for our people! Nalili called out in their own vibrating language, then exhaled out harshly as the gravity hit them all at once. Nalili's eyes nearly vibrated as he forced himself upright, and he felt his newly bulging leg muscles straining against the gravity. Behind him, someone fell to the ground with a cry, but he didn't look back. 
of Crested Butte. Nalili muttered out in English, stepping forward with a sharp exhale as he sat in the seat. Prairie flowers and shady trees. The simulation started and Nalili powered through it, landing the cargo ship with little trouble. The light turned green and Nalili sat up, his core muscles flexing as he did, and he soldiered on to the next step. It was a three-pound box sitting on the ground, and he had to lift it into a green square on the shelf. Nalili did what he saw the humans do, pounding his chest while exhaling and grunting, then squatted down with perfect form and grabbed the box. His leg and arm muscles bulged as he lifted the box, sweat pouring down his skin and feathers as soon as he stood upright. He blinked away the sweat, setting the box down on the shelf. The square lit up green, then tossed the box back down onto the floor by tilting upwards, letting the box slide off towards where it roughly was before being picked up by Nalili. Next, there were five knee-high walls, and Nalili had to jump over them while jogging. He was breathing hard now, wiping at the sweat on his face with the sleeve of his workout suit, but he started forward anyway. His nails made heavy clacks on the wooden floor as he hopped over the small walls, grunting as he came down onto the decking, but he made it over the fifth wall with only a small stumble, quickly coming back up to his feet and leaning backwards, breathing out tersely. Of grass bathed in sun, water of cool blue and stone, Nalili whispered to himself, sniffing as his body struggled to maintain its composure. Next was the walk-jog run, and Nalili started walking without pause, swinging his arms like Stephen had taught him to. He heard a chime ring above him after a good while of walking, letting him know it was time to jog. He breathed out harshly and started to jog, and the sweat came on in force. By the time he had to run, his feathers were dripping beads of the stuff onto the ground, and he left a little trail behind him. His lungs hurt, he had a stitch in his side, and his knees ached something terrible, but he would not falter here. He ran with all his might, swinging his arms and pumping his legs just like Stephen had said to, and he closed his eyes. Nalili kept his eyes squeezed shut, his lungs burning as he drew in the cold air of the space station and gasped out loudly when the chime came again. Gold Plume Engineer Lalili, you have a five-minute break. A voice called out over the intercom, and Nalili sank down onto the floor his chest pumping up and down as he tried to catch his breath. You shouldn't have done that, came a chuckling voice over the intercom, and Nalili recognized it was Stephen. What goes down? Must have coming up, Nalili cried out, now laughing as he recognized his blunder. He had laid down, which meant he had to stand up eventually. A female optigan came crashing down next to him her breath heaving into her lungs with a wheeze as her bright purple feathers vibrated from the effort of her body. By all means, take a breather, Silver Plume Engineer Captic, the voice said over the intercom, and they all heard the crisp start of laughter before the mic cut off. A thanking, Captic cried out, her heavy chest so soaked that Nalili could see the complete outline of her sports bra, a handy piece of clothing that all the female optican were wearing. This sucks, Nalili said to her in their native tongue, and he leaned up with a long, painful groan. Keptic nodded. I agree. It's worse that we have to sometimes wait for our turn at the tasks. Why I try to get so far ahead. I'm not sure what's worse, really. Both of them chuckled. One minute, go, Plume Engineer Nalili, the voice said above them. Nalili waved his hand. Yeah, yeah, of hearing, he groaned, slowly getting back up to his feet and wobbled slightly towards the next obstacle. This was a new test, but one he already knew, the water bags. Before him were two one-gallon jugs of water, in plastic bottles of all things, and he had to pick them up, press them over his head, and place them back down repeating the exercise five times. It was a struggle in earth gravity, but the fifth rep was so tiring he had to let go early, 
the jug splashing down to the ground with hollow thumpsh of water. Of nuts. Nalili muttered in English, always having found that phrase funny. A human stepped out from a doorway, holding two new jugs of water in one hand and a mop in the other. Nalili gave a short, dry laugh. You are of showing off. <laughs> I am not, the human said with a laugh, then waved the jugs of water at Nalili. I've got this. Go on and complete your tasks. He is so casual about it. Nalili thought to himself bitterly, watching the ease of the human's movements, but he did move on to the next challenge. There were only two left, the crawl and the wheeled machine. He got through the crawling challenge with a lot of huffing and puffing and trying to keep his tail from getting caught under his feet, and came out of the other side just as sweaty as when he had started. Now there was the car sitting there all innocent looking despite the terror it brought to his chest. His heart hammered violently as he thumped down into the seat, strapping himself into the harness while breathing up towards the ceiling. He realized all of a sudden he was the first optican to even make it this far, as a little dial on the wall read zero below a sentence that read, Opticans have arrived to challenge the station. The others had had numbers, but this... This was still zero. At the far end of the wall near a door, another dial said zero, while its phrase read, Opticans who have passed in victory. Welcome to Earth. Nalili glued his eyes to the sign, reading it under his breath. Welcome to Earth. He was so close, and his eyes widened with the realization. Gold Plume Engineer Nalili, prepare for your final test. The voice rang out from above him, and all the other optican paused, turning in surprise to see Nalili at the far end of the room. Area clear. Begin speed test. The wheeled car shuddered, and Nalili sucked in a breath. Of pretty flowers, colors of blue and purple. Nalili whispered to himself in a panic as the car began to speed up, the wind catching his feathers. Of blue sky, and sun of warmth and comfort. The wind began howling in a shallow, close to the skull ears, the feather tufts on them rustling in the wind, of soft grass and smells of rain. His vision was beginning to blur as a small screen in front of him read out two G's, and his body felt like it was going to collapse. Darkness ebbed in at the corner of his eyes, but Nalili squeezed his thigh and stomach muscles, remembering what human fighter pilots did to combat the hard G's. 2.5 G's. He squeezed, then released. Squeezed, then released while quietly shrieking to himself, of running through meadows with palms touching grass heads. 3 G's, the screen read out, then began a 10 second countdown. Nalili squeezed and released with all his might, closing his eyes as he focused on not passing out. He couldn't fail here, not now, not so close to the end. He felt like he was going to finally pass out when he felt the car begin to slow, and his eyes snapped open, his mouth gaping and sucking in loud, shuddering breaths. He stared wide-eyed as the car came to a stop, his body shaking from the pure adrenaline running through his veins, and he heard a soft ding from the wall. Nalili looked, and there upon the counter now stood a one, and the light had turned green. Just of walking out? Nalili asked Josephine, the female human holding open the door for him. She shrugged. I mean, you could crawl, but I think walking is better. Nalili laughed and leaned out of the wheeled all-terrain vehicle, his talon feet clicking on the roadway. It had taken a few more weeks of getting used to the Earth gravity side of the station, as well as a few more tests, but he was finally here. He had asked for a single day before he started work, and it was happily granted. The lovely brown-haired woman named Josephine had even volunteered to drive him out to this little grassy area of Crescent Butte, and he... he was finally here. Nalili started to cry as he stepped forward, the hard gravity of earth feeling feather light as he stepped out into the grass. He felt his soul fly as he let out a sob, coming down gently onto his knees and running his hands along the flowers. 
to think that humans almost had to lose all of this to make war materials, to become like his own planet. Nalili let out a wet laugh as he leaned down and sniffed at the flowers, their scents filling his head like the sweetest perfume. Is it like you imagined? Josephine asked as she stepped beside him, her hands in her pockets as she looked around at the mountain view. Nalili laughed again, sniffing before standing up beside Josephine and holding his hands to his face. No. No? Josephine asked quizzically, pulling a tissue out of her pocket and handing it to Nalili. Nalili took it, dabbing at his eyes as he looked out into the ocean of waving green grass, rustling trees, and sweet mountain wind. <laughs> no, is of so much more. At Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, Freyron slammed down her patrol cap, yelling out in frustration as she ripped another tick from her dull yellow fur while Himmel and Zetrin rolled their eyes nearby. This planet is a hellhole! How do humans even live here? 